Something was stalking the forests and pastures of southern France. Something monstrous. Literally. Between 1764 and 1767, around 100 people in the Jovadon region of southern France met violent deaths. Around 50 or so people were able to survive the terrifying and brutal attacks. According to the locals, the culprit behind these killings was a creature known simply as the Beast of Jovadon. What was this beast? Through the centuries, lots of different candidates have been proposed. Some say it was just some extraordinary wolf or pack of wolves. Others have suggested a wolf-dog hybrid, or that maybe it was an escaped lion or hyena. Most boringly, uh, some have said that there was no beast, and the whole thing was simply a case of mass hysteria. Some have even suggested that it was a human serial killer, or some prehistoric beast that somehow survived to early modern times. Well, each of us three has done our own research, and right now we will present our own best case for solving the mystery of the Beast of Jovadon. I'm Matt, and I'm a novelist. I'm Brian, I'm a designer and illustrator. I'm Drew, and I'm a physical therapist. We work together to create books about dinosaurs, ancient cultures, and mysteries. We love this stuff. But we don't always agree. We are... Now, earlier on, I mentioned that the beast killed around 100 people and injured around 50. But we need to take those numbers with a grain of salt. Record keeping was far from standardized during that period, and we can't be precisely sure which deaths are attributable to the beast. It's quite possible that some people were killed by the beast, and their deaths were never reported. It's also possible that some people were assumed to be killed by the beast who actually met their deaths in other ways. In short, this number could easily be significantly higher or lower. But the general consensus of the sources I've read put it around that range. There's another point that I want to start off by emphasizing, because so much of this story sounds like something from Grimm's fairy tales. But this stuff really happened. Dozens of real people met horrible and violent deaths, and we're not sure why. There was real human suffering here, and we do want to be respectful of that. But there's also the fact that two and a half centuries later, we are still baffled by what exactly caused all that human suffering. All right, here are the basics. One of the complicating factors here is the Jovadon region of France. It's still pretty remote and rural to this day. But back in the late 18th century, it was considered an obscure backwater, a wilderness that had not been fully tamed. And make no mistake, Jovadon is beautiful. Green pastures, rich volcanic soil, dark forests, and jagged cliffs. Again, it looks like something out of Grimm's fairy tales. The sort of place when, shrouded in a little mist, you can easily imagine a monster. Now, as you can imagine, with so many attacks, about 100 killed, about 50 survivors, there were reams of reports from the survivors of these attacks. It's kind of hard to know what to do with these reports. It's easy to imagine that some of them may have been embellished or exaggerated in the retelling, and some of the memories might have been colored by the understandable terror that the victims were in. So it should come as no surprise that these reports don't always agree with each other. As researcher Brian Dunning explained, quote, There is little consistency to the reports. The beast was said to be red and covered with scales, or it had long fur and a mane and black stripes. It had a long, thin head like a greyhound, or it had an enormous head with a huge mouth. It had great talons instead of a wolf's claws. It could run at supernatural speed. Sometimes it hunted alone, sometimes with the mate, sometimes with its young. End quote. And, as it so often does, the Wikipedia entry for The Beast of Jovanion gives a pretty good summation of these varying accounts. It says that the beast was, quote, a tawny russet color with dark streaks or stripes and a dark stripe down its back, a tail longer than a wolf's, ending in a tuft, according to some contemporary eyewitnesses. 
It was said to attack with formidable teeth and claws and appeared to be the size of a calf or cow and seemed to fly or bound across the fields toward its victims, end quote. And again, with all these different accounts factored in, there are a few other themes as well. First and most troubling was the beast's choice of prey. It never attacked the herds of cattle or sheep. It only attacked the humans. Some of the bodies were found only in bits and pieces and obviously had been eaten. Other bodies were found only with injuries to the neck and seemed to have been killed basically for sport. Really, reading these reports is really gruesome. Now, the obvious candidate for the beast would be a wolf. Wolves did live in Gévaudan at this time, as they lived throughout much of Europe. Wolf attacks on livestock were nothing new and would have been something the locals were familiar with. Wolf attacks on humans probably would have happened as well, though these would have been much more rare. It's now well established that wolves, in general, don't view humans as a prey source. And absent extraordinary circumstances, they typically leave humans alone. But these extraordinary circumstances do sometimes occur. So the locals would have been familiar with wolf attacks. And there's one thing where these witnesses seem to agree almost across the board. The beast was not a wolf. Yes, it had many wolf-like characteristics, but the locals, who again would be very familiar with the wildlife in their region, said there were key differences between the beast and the wolves. Now, eventually, news of these killings in Jovedon began to spread as the killings themselves piled up. Newspaper headlines reported these gruesome deaths in breathless detail. These tales eventually spread all the way to King Louis XV at his palace in Versailles. The king sent his own royal hunters to kill the beast. Soon, Gévaudan was crawling with monster hunters. During one hunt, an estimated 30,000 men were participating. Uh, their tactics included traps of all kinds. Everything from using poison meat as bait to dressing soldiers up as women to trick the beast into attacking. Nothing worked. The beast seemed impervious to harm, either from spears or from guns. There were several reports of the beast seeming to be mortally wounded, only to later get up off the ground and escape. Some of the attacks happened in quick succession over an impossibly large distance, leading some to suggest that there was more than one beast. Some even attributed supernatural powers to the beast and suggested it could walk on two legs, kind of like a werewolf. And the beast was also clever, apparently able to see through even the most widely of traps that the hunters set. Now, eventually, in September 1765, the lieutenant of the king's hunt, Francois Antoine, got something. It was a wolf, an abnormally large one. It weighed about 130 pounds when most wolves were about 80 pounds. In addition, some of the victims made a positive identification and even spotted scars which they said they inflicted on the beast as they were fighting for their lives. Antoine would later kill what he claimed were pups of the beast. These pups were noted for having double dew claws on above their paws. Note that point for later. The king was thrilled with the result and declared that the beast had been killed and the case was closed. And the killings did stop. For a while, several months later, the killing started again. The king was pretty much over it by this point, so he didn't send any further aid. That left it for the locals of Gévaudan to kill the beast themselves. And when you consider the fact that, unlike the fancy royals, the locals actually knew the terrain and the wildlife, that may have been a better idea from the start. The man credited with the final kill was a local hunter and poacher named Jean Chastel. Uh, for his part, Chastel thought the creature was a werewolf, so he apparently loaded his musket with silver in addition to all the usual fare and began stalking the creature through the woods. He eventually fatally wounded the creature and brought the body back for measurement. Now there's good news and bad news with what happened to the body. The good news is that it was able to be measured and it was written down in a report called the Marin Report. Unfortunately, that's where the good news stops. The body was flaunted to all the locals who came in to get a piece, literally, of the monster. Some of them took scalpels and started taking pieces of it apart. So by the time the report could be filed, most of the most interesting parts of the creature were gone. Furthermore, many wanted to bring it up to Paris, where the more scientifically trained biologists could try to identify it. But apparently, 
the beast had already been sitting in a box in the hot French summers and had reached such a state of putrefaction that they just buried it. The remains were therefore lost forever. However, after this, the killings finally stopped for good. The Marn Report notes that the dimensions of the beast are roughly the size of a wolf. However, it goes on to note, quote, This animal appears to be a wolf, but an extraordinary one. By its figure and its proportions, it is very different from the wolves that one sees in this country. This is what more than 300 people from all around have certified. Once again, whatever happened in Jovadon, it was real. Real people died at rates far in excess of what we would expect from normal wolf predation on humans. The question isn't whether the phenomenon happened, it's what caused it. Okay, Brian, what do you think caused it? So, I am going to be taking the approach of an animal that people believe to be extinct, but maybe it's not extinct. Surprised? Not at all. Great. Me neither. So, as we look into the description of the creature, it has a lot of characteristics like you were describing, Matt, that look like a wolf, but a little bit of an enhanced wolf sometimes. What if it's not a wolf, but something called a bear dog? Have you ever heard of these? I have not heard of bear dogs. All right. This is going to be pretty cool, okay? <laughs> so the bear dog is also called the, I'm going to see if I can get the name of this right, Amphision. So this is a creature that is believed to have gone extinct. It used to live in, Euro in Eurasia, into Europe, Asia, and also some various types have been found in North America. So basically what this animal is, the best way to describe it is literally the mix of a wolf and a bear. So it has a body that's a little more similar to a bear, but it has a long tail that's, um, in the pictures I've seen, it looks a little more similar to like a lion, but it's a long tail, but then its head is like a huge wolf. So there's a few different species that they that they have discovered. Some of it they vary in size, just like dogs do, or wolves do even. But they can grow as big as like two and a half meters up to like a thousand pounds. They can be very very big, and the ones that they found that are on the bigger side look more wolf like or look more bear like. But kind of the ones in that middle range look a little bit more wolf like. So they don't think that these creatures are directly related to wolves or bears. They're kind of like a middle ground, right? <laughs> so they're like cousins to to the creatures, right? But not directly related. Some pros for this. One, people have never seen what this creature looks like. So when it comes to the markings of the beast, it could directly relate to this. <laughs> no you evidence one way or the other. <laughs> you can't prove, you can't prove that it wrong. didn't look it. Yeah. You can't prove me wrong, so... <laughs> I win. <laughs> the second case is kind of what you were saying, Matt, how the locals would have been would have seen wolves and know what wolves look like. And when they're describing this as looking kind of like a wolf, but bigger and scarier and not quite like a wolf, it would make sense that this would line up with that, right? Again, its head looks like a wolf. Its like snout and its teeth are very wolf-like. Its body is bigger like a bear, but it still has the long tail. So you can see how that could lead to some of these descriptions that you're seeing going around. Another thing, a pro with this as well, it seemed like most of the attacks, I know you said that there were some descriptions of it hunting in packs, some of it hunting alone. It seems like this was more of a solitary creature. So it would make sense that this would be kind of a sole rogue beast roaming around the French countryside, right? wreaking havoc havoc and then again once the beast was killed the locals were fascinated with it and pieced it apart like you said <laughs> if it was just a wolf it would seem odd that they would do that right but it had to be something that they didn't know what it was so one of the popular um creatures that people think this is is a hyena 
which you can kind of see looks like a wolf a little bit different, but it is described having a tail. Hyenas don't really have much of a tail to note. And we know how we get hung up on tails from one of our previous episodes. We just had a huge discussion on tails. (laughs) We did. So yeah, this one obviously has a tail more described in the um, encounters where a hyena wouldn't. Any questions? Let's address the obvious thing, right? Given the fact that, you know, Brian, me and you disagree on the age of the earth. You think the earth is young. I think it's, it's old. So we're going to have different prior probabilities for how plausible it is for something like this to survive. But even given that, even under your model, there'd have to be a population of these things surviving for thousands of years at least. And you'd think yes. other people would have seen it before Jean Vadon. So how do you explain all that? And that, Matt, is the question, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> Where I think my argument breaks down. <laughs> um, yes, I think this is a really cool possibility. <laughs> but do I think it's the most credible? No. Because, <laughs> yes, I, I would have to say that to make this more legitimate, I would have to see more evidence of things like this happening throughout history. There doesn't seem to be that thread. Like, I... I I can see when we talk more about the dinosaurs, right? Where it's like, you can kind of see that thread of truth and evidence within mythology and different stories from around the world where it's like, you can kind of see how that would work. But with this one, there's no real evidence of that that I've been able to find. It's just a cool candidate. <laughs> but okay, maybe, so knows, maybe there was a rogue one that was, maybe there was a population <laughs> way out in the boonies where nobody ever saw them in this one. It got trapped away. in ice just like Captain America and you know well, it wouldn't have had to get trapped in ice. It was just there was a population of them living somewhere else in Europe. This one somehow straight away wreaked havoc on this random spot in France. Plausible. Oh. I don't know. <laughs> okay, so it sounds like Brian, your heart is for the bear dogs, but your head cannot accept it. Yes. All right, Very so so fun. let's try let let's try something here. Um, so let's say okay, we know Jovadon was a very isolated part of France, right? Very wild. So maybe a very small population can survive there, and yeah. because it's so isolated, it stories don't get out. And then maybe the peasants finally do start encroaching on their territory, and that's what sets the few last survivors off to go on this rampage, like they're. They feel pressure, like their prey is being threatened, their territory is threatened, so yeah. they reach out to the to the available uh, easy prey source. Or maybe we could say that legends of werewolves throughout Europe could have their basis Ooh. in bear dogs. Maybe for all we knew, they sometimes would go on hind feet, and that could get get uh, people talking. That They'd is be a big great enough. theory that I did not think of, and. I like they'd it. be big. They'd be big <laughs> enough so that if they did rear up to their hind paws, that they'd be more than man sized, right? Well, and and if, they're, they're... if its body is built more like a bear, it would make sense that it would stand on its two feet. Then there you go. I have no idea bear. what the science is on bear dog anatomy. This may not even be plausible, we're, but we're, we're just spitballing here. Uh, Drew, any other on their two feet? <laughs> <laughs> not for long, but you know, <laughs> completely within the realm of possibility. It is. And now I'm also convinced these are werewolves. So thank you, man. <laughs> Win. <laughs> we just discovered our next episode. Wow. All right. So there was Brian making his, as far as we know, original pitch that the bear dog is not only the beast of Jovadon, but also werewolves. So now we're going to go to Drew, which, sorry for the editorializing, Brian, seems a little less fanciful. And that is something that sounds a little fanciful at the beginning but actually it might be plausible. Drew, take it away. That's what I thought about mine in the beginning, though. And look at where we came to. <laughs> yeah, touche. <laughs> so I have a question for you guys first. I'm going to say a quote of what someone described an animal that we know of today as and see if you can guess what it is, okay? All right. Sounds it has good. four feet with cloven hooves, a mane like a, like a horse, conspicuous tusks, a horse's tail, it neighs, and it's the size of the largest ox. 
Any guesses? Is it a like a wild boar? Brian? I have no idea. I'm really racking my brain here. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So this is a quote by the Greek historian Herodotus in 450 BC when he went to go visit Egypt. And he was describing a hippo. Um, oh, so, uh, well, but some of that's not right. No. And that's that's <laughs> the thing. So he literally saw a hippo, but he came back and described using adjectives that just aren't aren't there for a hippo. As we can see, eyewitness accounts aren't always accurate, as I'm sure you can tell us, Matthew. So to say Methuselah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so we have the description of this beast. It's a the size of a cat, thick hide, reddish brown fur with a stripe running down its back. I'll just go ahead and say that my most pos- my my guess of what the animal is is that it's a lion. Not the most exciting idea, but I think here... a lion loose in the south of France is pretty exciting, personally. Yeah. But it was also described as crawling on its belly and then pouncing when it was going to attack, which describes just kind of almost any feline. It also is, there was descriptions of glowing, fiery red eyes, which a lot of big cats will have that reflective thing going on in their eyes at night. So, you know, to someone's imagination right before they're going to get mauled, maybe it looks red and, and evil. One of the things I was going to bring up is the, I don't know if you guys have heard of the Savo lions. Yes, I was hoping you were going to get into these. So the Savo lions, those were in 1898, there was a pair of lions, mainless male lions, that terrorized these two countries um, and killed an estimated 35 to 130 people. These lions... They would eat a lot of their victims, but they also, there is reports that they just kill kind of for fun and leave the bodies, which is so what the Beast of Jevodon also did. There's also, there's reports of like the noble aristocrats and those types of people that would have these exotic pets imported. Who's to say that one didn't just, you know, get out of its cage and go on a terrorizing, destructive path in France? That is one of the points that you just touched on that I want to get into, because when you say it's a lion in the south of France, again, that sounds really fanciful at first blush. But when you get into the details, it's actually pretty plausible. Like like you said, Drew, just like today, some you know weirdo rich guys would keep lions on their stage just because they thought they were cool and a status symbol. There were also zoos. There were traveling menageries. So there were opportunities for lions to be in the area and maybe some of them escape, right? Yeah, definitely plausible. Also related to that is the knowledge that the locals are going to have of lions. Now, if you're a peasant in extreme rural France in the late 18th century, you're going to know what a lion is, but you've probably never seen a lion. Now, maybe if you live in Paris, there's a zoo you could go to, or if you're really rich, maybe you have a rich friend who has one. But if you're a poor peasant in France, you've heard stories of lions, but you've probably never seen one. So if you actually see one out in the wild, it might be just like what you said with Herodotus, where you're going to use the language that you have available. So it's going to be something that looks kind of like a wolf, but also not really in these other ways. So that that Mm -hmm. seems quite plausible when, when seen through that light. Question with that, though. Are there cats in the south of France, though? Like house cats? Yeah, house cats, any kind of wild cats. Probably. I would guess that there's cats. Because so my one hang up with this is when it, they say it looks like a big cat. Oh, that's a. Um... Yeah. Well, I could see that, but it's. A lion is so much larger than a house cat that when you're in the heat of the moment, I don't think you're going to think, that's a gigantic cat. It's like, oh, that's about the size of a wolf, but bigger. You know, well, and when you're getting attacked, yeah, but after they killed it mm-hmm. and they looked at it, went to be oh. like, oh, it looks kind of like a big cat. Yeah. I, when Just I was reading thought. the the account of like the description, or they never really named the beast, right? Like when they killed it, they kind of just, yeah, they didn't give a name to it or 
did I don't even know did they do a description of the animal once they killed it? There was a description of one officer, I believe, who said that the beast looked a little <clears throat> bit like part lion. Like its father was a lion and its mother was who knows what, you know, something like that. Mm, yeah. So that was on the radar for at least some of the more aristocratic hunters. Gotcha. Yeah. I do like this theory, though. I was just going to say, and some people might uh, say that, well, lions have manes. Um, and it one of the thoughts is that it could have been like in a sub-adult male lion which they don't have manes and they kind of where they do have a mane they have a dark stripe that runs down their back um but the savo lions they um the lions in savo typically tend to not have manes because it's so hot there or at least that's what scientists believe is that they they ditch the manes to be less hot one reason that they might not name a lion if because usually a mains tagged along with that. So so related to that, Drew, is the issue of the tail. Now, some of the accounts mention that the tail is longer than a wolf's tail and significantly with a tuft of fur at the end. That is not how wolves' tails look, but that's exactly how lions' tails look. That's so that's, that's another thing that gives more credence to it. That is true. I guess a lot of hunters obviously went out there and there was accounts of several hunters and soldiers shooting it and it kind of like it would get hit go down then come back up and run off and i thought that was interesting then i was reading about when they eventually did kill these lions they used a 303 british round which i had to look it up it's the uh, velocity for that is 770 meters per second and then the average french was 300 to 370 meters per second So there's quite a bit of difference. So I think it's, they were using weaker weapons back in the 1700s, obviously. So Yeah, and and to that point, a lot of people don't assume this, but lions have extraordinarily tough skin. Their their skin is also designed to be very loose. So if you look at a lion, its skin almost looks like it's too big for its body. Uh, That's deliberate. And that's if they get into a fight or something, you get the loose skin (laughs) instead of going through the lion. So mm-hmm. you'll see some reports of like, like you said, Drew, getting shot and not having an effect, uh, trying to spear it but not getting through its hide. That's perfectly plausible for a lion. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and the lions are typically they're pretty big. The lion that was shot, one of them was measured at nine feet eight inches from nose to the tip of the tail, which kind of fits the description of is the size of a donkey or a, or a calf. Yep. In in this behavior in lions is well established in certain cases like, like you mentioned drew the, those two lions that that they finally captured with the giant uh great bullet but there's more instances of that within the past couple centuries as well lions are also tigers what happens is when specific populations of lions are put under very sudden stress like say new settlers move into their territory or there's a disease that takes down a lot of their food supply In desperation, certain lions will turn to more easily captured prey. And humans Mm -hmm. are a lot easier to capture than a zebra. And Mm -hmm. every now and then, some small groups of lions get really good at this. And they'll just keep doing it over and over and over again. Again, there's numerous examples of this happening. We know it happens. So you'd imagine that if a lion, you know, a, a captured lion, breaks out of a menagerie or some traveling circus or whatever it's going to be under a lot of that similar pressure. And it's very plausible that just like the the other lions in Africa, it's going to start turning to the easy prey source, humans. Mm-hmm. And there's, I was reading an article that there's a correlation between lions that do kind of get a taste for human flesh and having poor, poor uh, dental health because humans are actually much more, they're, we're, we're soft creatures compared to... <laughs> hippos or pretty much anything very very fleshy so so when they finally get the the lions or the tigers they realize they had teeth problems and that's what led them to humans yeah yeah i like this theory <laughs> i think it's i pretty do too cool. i like it a lot actually yeah. <laughs> yeah when i when i thought about the the connection between the the savo lions and the beast of javadon i was like oh that kind of sounds familiar Okay, now it's time for my choice. 
And that is that the beast was, probably several, wolf-dog hybrids. We know that wolf-dog hybrids happen. Dogs and wolves can interbreed with each other, and they're all around the world today. In certain areas, a huge percentage of the wolf population has some dog ancestry. Some people even have them as pets. Wolf-dog hybrids would have existed back in Gévaudan as well. As a rural community that raised a lot of livestock, there would have been lots of dogs in the area. Herding dogs, hunting dogs, and, most significantly, dogs for protecting livestock. Now, in this region in particular, the dog that would protect livestock was called the Boceron. Bocerons uh, can get very big. Uh, in the modern day, some can get up to 100 pounds. And that is significant because, remember, wolves in the wild usually are around 80 pounds. But if they crossed with one of these Boserons, their offspring could potentially be a lot larger. This is especially the case because of a phenomenon in genetics known as hybrid vigor. What that means is that a hybrid could grow to be larger than either one of its parents. So if we take a creature whose parent was 100 pounds and get it even bigger, well, suddenly we have the makings of a monster. Also, wolf-dog hybrids can have very unpredictable temperaments. Some of them can be very docile and sweet and behave pretty much like dogs. Others behave more like wolves. Still others can be even more aggressive than typical wolves. All right, so imagine we have this, say, a population of wolf-dog hybrids. They're much larger than a typical wolf, maybe even larger than a boceron. And some of them are going to be more aggressive than wolves. What are they going to prey upon? Especially if they're isolated from other wolves or other dogs. Where, if you can imagine a situation where one of these crossings happens, it's pretty plausible. Well, one of these wolf-dog hybrids, left to its own devices, might start looking for food in the easiest ways it can. And particularly easy prey would be humans. This is also something that is well established in the scientific literature. I mentioned at the beginning of this episode that wolves generally do not view humans as a food source, and that's true. But there are exceptional circumstances when wolves do prey on humans. And that's generally in situations where wolves feel under threat. Maybe their habitat's being taken away, their food source is taken away, they feel desperate for some reason, so they turn to humans as an easier food source. And when they do that, they generally turn to preying on women and children. Again, this is documented. In instances when humans are preyed upon by wolves, overwhelmingly, they're women or children who are on their own. Wolves target the most vulnerable examples possible. And again, that's exactly what happened here with the Beast of Jovadon. Another thing to keep in mind is the appearance of the Beast of Jovadon. Again, the witnesses said that it looked like a wolf, but not exactly. That pretty much seems like a description of a lot of wolf-dog hybrids. Some wolf-dog hybrids look pretty much exactly like wolves. Others take more after the dog side. So they could have things like reddish coats or stripes down their back, or have proportions that aren't what we would typically see from a wolf. Again, exactly what was described for the Beast of Jovadon. Finally, and in my opinion, most significantly, is the dew claws. At least one of the beasts that was killed and claimed to be one of the beasts of Jovanion had double dew claws on its paws. Double dew claws are exceedingly rare in wild wolves. However, they're quite common in domestic dogs and are seen quite frequently on wolf-dog hybrids. That strongly suggests that at least one of them was a wolf-dog hybrid. So, in short, that is my explanation for the Beast of Jovanion. For whatever reason, maybe it was one wolf who particularly liked being romantic with the lady dogs. Maybe it was a pack of wolf-dog hybrids or like a litter that got particularly aggressive. Maybe it was some combination of all of these. For whatever reason, there existed in Jovanion during those years an especially large group of wolf-dog hybrids they were especially large and especially aggressive. They got desperate and turned to the food source that they felt was the most easily accessible to them, humans. What about, um, you know, the just like the general hardiness of a dog or a wolf-dog hybrid, like taking the 
multiple shots from muskets or spears and everything that it was thrown at and still like bouncing back from all that. No, that's a really good point because uh, like I mentioned earlier with hybrid vigor, hybrids are often larger than either of their parents. And to your point, Drew, they're oftentimes a lot hardier as well. So Mm. they're exceptionally healthy. They're going to be exceptionally vigorous and it's not too much of a stretch then to assume that they could be faster, they could be stronger than typical wolves or typical dogs could be. And maybe that includes being able to withstand uh, attacks more easily. Oh, and uh, just so y'all know, there is a dimension here that is worth at least mentioning. Remember Jean Chastel, that hunter slash poacher who finally killed the final beast? Well, there is a theory floating around that he had something to do with Uh, creating the beast in the first place. Here's how the theory goes. One, we know that John Chastel's family had a red-coated mastiff. So mastiff, a gigantic dog, red coat, something that was seen in some descriptions on the beast of uh, Jovanion. Two, John seemed to have a very familiar knowledge of where to find the beast and was finally able to take it down. Also, he seemed to really get a lot of reward from killing the beast. He became a local hero. Also, and frankly, here's where the theory breaks apart, the beast of Jovanion terrorizing the countryside distracted the locals from Jean Chastel's other occupation, poaching. So the theory goes that Jean Chastel, in order to distract the authorities from his poaching activities, intentionally bred his red-coated mastiff with a wolf creating a gigantic, terrifying hybrid, which he then trained and sicked on the population, creating the scare of the Beast of Jovanion. And to make it more impervious to the attacks of others, he went so far as to cover the beast in hardened boar's hide to make sure that it it could withstand all attacks. Any questions about that? (laughs) That that made it more interesting right there. I had heard that. (laughs) But yeah, I like that one. So the obvious flaw with this is the motive. It's a pretty harebrained scheme to distract from poaching to uh, create a mythical beast and kill hundreds of people. This really sounds more like uh, Hound of the Baskervilles than anything real. So again, I do not find that plausible at all, but the wolf hybrid part is. So maybe John Chastel's Mastiff really did cross with the wolf, and that's how one of the hybrids was created. That part's plausible. The harebrained scheme is not, but it's at least worth mentioning. What is that uh, the thing that you were saying it's called when you have the, the hybrids? Hybrid vigor. Hybrid vigor. Is a liger a result of hybrid vigor? They're yeah. usually bigger. Oh, that's interesting. Same thing with uh, mules. Not necessarily with size, but mules have a lot of advantages uh, that uh, horses and donkeys don't have. With the dewclaw. Does that, or the double dew claw, does that have, can any dog mating with a wolf produce a double dew claw, or does it have to be a dog like with a double dew claw? I don't know exactly how the genetics of that work, but I do know, uh, here are the two things I do know. One, double dew claws are exceedingly rare in wild wolves, mm-hmm. but two, they're relatively common in domestic dogs and apparently were established in the region. So if a dog were to cross with the wolf, I believe that genetically speaking, it's perfectly plausible that their offspring would have a double dew claw. Gotcha. So yeah, I'm like my dog. I have a great Pyrenees. She has a double dew claw. That's pretty, that's standard in their breed, which Mm -hmm. and they're from the Parisian mountains. Same similar area. Yep. The French dog, like guard dogs could in theory breed with the wolves and obviously great pyrenees can be really big too like in the like 120 pound range i mean picture a 120 Uh, pound pyrenees crossing with the wolf that's even bigger than that that's uh that's a pretty terrifying thing right there (laughs) my dog would never attack anybody though your dog wouldn't but would her wolf (laughs) children good maybe And there you have it. Thank you so much for watching. Uh, Like I've mentioned before, we're a new channel, so we really appreciate uh, if you'd like or subscribe. 
If you want to watch another video where we spent a long time discussing the tails that hang from various wild creatures, check out our video on the behemoth. Also, remember to leave a comment. Let us know your theories on what the beast is. We'd love to hear your thoughts. And don't forget to boop that like button and subscribe. Also, help me start the bear dog werewolf revolution. <laughs>